So I just like to encourage you as we come together <coughs> to practice to just um, have a really soft intention for our sitting together this evening. And it could be something as simple as, um, you know, may I, may I practice with kindness toward myself this evening? Or may I let myself feel supported by everyone here and recognize that I'm, I'm a source of support for the other people here in our, our Zoom gallery. So I just find it helpful sometimes to have a, have a very soft intention as I begin to practice. And I've got a, a little bell, so I'll just ring it once to start and once to stop. So just find a position that feels friendly enough, that feels supportive, that doesn't feel like you're straining. And just allow yourself to come into to the practice. And as we practice together tonight, just allow yourself to come into the body. And be in the body just with a sense of appreciation for the support the body offers. Feeling yourself sitting or perhaps lying down. And just feel that you're taking your place. Your place in this community here tonight. And in a much larger sense, your place in our wonderful and complex ecosystem. And please recognize that you belong wherever you are tonight, you belong. And so often our formal meditation practice is characterized by just maybe a tinge of striving of that wanting to get it right, wanting to do it right. And I would encourage you to see if you can just note any striving and just let go of it. See if you can practice with just a very open sense of receptivity. I'm just allowing sensations to arise and pass away, or emotions to arise and pass away. Just letting yourself relax into an open and easy awareness
And if that seems stressful, ironically, you're certainly welcome to let your attention be with your breath or whatever seems most supportive for being completely present. But if you can, I would encourage you to try just this relaxed open awareness as if you're sitting by a great lake with a big sky and just allowing yourself to be aware of the movement of the water, the movement of the clouds, not needing to do anything except be aware.
I thought I'd um, begin tonight with um, a story and it's um, a story about Yvonne Rand. And Yvonne Rand was a student of Suzuki Roshi and eventually she became one of the senior um, Zen teachers at San Francisco Zen Center. She died um, just a few years ago, but she was a really important member of the San Francisco uh, Zen Center and that community and was um, a very respected, um, uh, very respected person. And it must have been in the late 90s when I heard her give a talk in Minneapolis and it was with Compassionate Ocean um, Zen Center. And it was uh, when they were still meeting in uh, the Mount Curve Unitarian Church. So I'm guessing that it was probably the late 90s that I heard her tell this story that just made such a tremendous uh, impression on me. And the story was that she and her husband had a home and it was in Marin, <coughs> in Marin County. And it was on one of the, you know, steep, um, hilly uh, areas in Marin County. And that uh, they had a privacy hedge that they had planted and nurtured um, along the edge of their property. And it was partly so that as cars came around the curve that the headlights of the curve would not just, the headlights would not go right into their house. And, um, and they planted this many years ago and nurtured it and took care of this hedge. And one day she got a notice from the California Department of Transportation that the hedge was a hazard, was a safety hazard, and the hedge would have to go. And she thought, this is just absurd. There's never been an accident here. We maintain the hedge so carefully. It's not a problem. There have been accidents other places on the road. Never an accident here. This is just ridiculous. And she said she also had the thought, my husband's a lawyer. I know a lot of people, you know, I matter in this community. We're gonna take care of this. And she said she started to contest the, uh, the uh, notice that she had to take down this hedge. And she said this went on for some years that they used, she said, she used every possible strategy to contest the judgment of the California Department of Transportation that this hedge was a problem. And she said, you know, that they had hearings, had appeals, um, people, I mean, she said everything. She just did everything. And she said it went on for some years. And finally, they got a notice that said, you know, you take down the hedge or we take it down and you pay for us taking it down. And she said, that was, that was it. And she said, the morning that they got up to dig up this hedge that they had planted and nurtured and um, she said she didn't know how she would feel, but she said, much to her surprise, she felt completely okay that she had um, no, no regrets because she said that she had done everything she possibly could, and this is the way it was. And I just thought this was such an amazing story and really took it to heart. 
this idea that as long as you did everything that you possibly could when um, you know that you, you don't get the the outcome you want it will be okay because you've known that you've done everything you could and the other aspect of that is if you don't do everything you can and you don't get the outcome that you want uh, that's kind of a cause for regret you know what what could i have done should i have done more the sort of thing that i think probably a lot of us are familiar with um, so i just really took this to um to heart and have have thought about this many many times throughout my my life and um two summers ago after the murder of george floyd and the uprising here in south minneapolis um close to where i live uh i live not far from common ground at all um i was just um had these just tremendous feelings of um, helplessness and inadequacy and just a lot of, of sense of um, feeling just kind of powerless about all the things that had, had gone wrong. And at the time I was reading Ibrahim Kendi's uh, book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And Kendi wrote in that book um, that you are an anti what an, an anti racist activist is someone who changes racist policy, not someone who reads a lot of books, who has discussion groups. Um, an anti racist activist is a person who changes racist policy. So I made a commitment that I was going to really work on uh, issues of policy and get politically involved. And I became involved uh, with an organization and some other uh, Buddhist friends were also involved with an organization that had as its vision, a multiracial democracy, a caring economy, and a just climate future. And I worked on, I, I got involved with this organization last January and have worked steadily on a number of political issues um, since then from uh, the primaries and the caucuses throughout the summer and up into the, um, the election. And I worked on uh, several issues. And in the last 10 weeks, I did a shift, a uh, three hour shift of phone banking every week. I did door knocking. I did canvassing. I wrote letters to the editor. I held meetings. I organized meetings. I did Zoom presentations. I got active me, on social media in a way that I never anticipated um and um you know, i i would in the last couple of weeks i spent hours uh, daily involved in correspondence and conversation and i just kept thinking that you know as long as i do everything i can no matter what happens it will be okay but just having this this um intention to do everything I, I could. Um, and, uh, and I really, I really pushed myself when there were a number of other people, quite a few other people, but some I, I was pretty close with who were also doing, doing this work of just, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of fun banging. Um, and, um, you know, the outcome wasn't what I wanted. And I was really disappointed. Um, I didn't know what the outcome would be. I wasn't, I wasn't especially um, 
optimistic. I just kept saying, you know, I don't know. It depends on how many people turn out, who turns out, the ages of the people who turn out. You know, it was really, really unknown. Um, I thought this is this is possible, but I just don't know. So I was really disappointed when the outcome wasn't what I had hoped for. But I really wasn't undone. I mean, I just really felt I did all I could. Um, a number of other people that I was working with did a tremendous amount of, of work. And um, I thought, okay, so we didn't prevail this time, but you know, the object of an anti-racist activist is to change policy. So you just keep working on it. You just like, what is the next thing to, to work on? Um, and I think about um, many years ago, years before I, I heard Yvonne Rand give this talk in the 80s, um, there was a person I admired and I told her that I admired her because she always came through with, um, with what she said she'd do. And she said that her rules for life were show up, pay attention, tell the truth and let go of the outcome. And again, that was, you know, sort of this amazing um, teaching for me because as in the case of Yvonne Rand, it was so clearly that this person really lived this, really lived this idea of showing up, paying attention, telling the truth and not being invested in the outcome. And I really decided that at that time, that that was what I would um, try to do. Um, and just as a sort of little parents, I noticed that sometimes I would show up for something, but I wouldn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. And when I noticed that, you know, the question was, well, why am I here then? If I don't want to pay attention, is this something that I should really be involved in? If I just get here to be here, but I'm not paying attention. If it was some place where I felt I couldn't tell the truth, you know, like, well, what am I doing here if I'm not uh, telling the truth? Or, you know, for the very beginning one, if I made excuses not to show up, if I said I, if I was kind of involved with something, but I was never really showing up. Or as we sometimes talk about it, you know, in, in Dharma circles about, you know, what does it mean to really show up? not just to get your body there, but to really show up. So I thought about those uh, principles and I realized and have realized over the years that, that these are the instructions that show up, pay attention, tell the truth, let go of the outcome. These are really the instructions for living a life with equanimity. And I think that that's kind of what this, um, what I've been thinking about um, over the past couple of months, um, and particularly in retrospect of the uh, disappointing election results. This idea of, of equanimity, and equanimity sometimes gets, um, confused with indifference. Indifference is called the near enemy of equanimity because sometimes um, you think you're being equanimous, but you're just really indifferent. But equanimity is that capacity to be with you know, the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. It's the ability not to fall into <clears throat> extremes, not to become kind of um, giddy when things go your way and not to fall into the abyss when things don't go the way you, you had hoped. It's, it's that idea of not falling into extremes. Um, and and an equanimous mind is a mind that is balanced and it is me, essentially a fair mind. 
uh, I heard someone say several months ago that um, that um, equanimity, if we think about equanimity as impartiality, that that's really one of the things that we want most in, um, in a democratic society, that we want um, impartial um, judges. We want impartial uh, lawmakers. We don't want people who are um, biased. We want a kind of impartiality. And, you know, I mean, you can think about things like, like sports. You want the umpire or the referee to be a fair, balanced person to sort of just tell the truth about what happened. So the other thing about equanimity is that equanimity always sees the big picture. And I think that's why uh, sometimes equanimity is talked about as a value, a quality of spiritual maturity that, you know, that from my experience, uh, the older I get, the bigger the picture is. You know, the more I have a more comprehensive um, understanding of how things are, it's appreciating that vast constellation of causes and conditions that bring about any situation and any experience. So it's really sort of taking that all in, um, understanding impermanence and, and change. And I find that what really supports um, and infuses equanimity um, and keeps it from, from just being um, this sort of dry, well, that's just the way things are, um, is, uh, is to infuse equanimity with a gratitude practice, or sometimes I, I think of it even just as appreciation uh, practice. Um, Psychologists sometimes say that you know gratitude is the single most effective intervention for a sense of well-being. That when we we can bring gratitude to um, to mind, and um, I think about a gratitude practice or a simple appreciation practice, um, you know, remembering the good. As I was thinking about this before um, I got on, on Zoom with you tonight, I was thinking about that um, Louis Armstrong uh, song, you know, it's a wonderful world. Um, just, uh, you know, taking a kind of joy and, and for people who are living in the, the upper Midwest, you know, we've had just this incredibly glorious fall that's just been um, so, uh, beautiful and prolonged and a lot of um, interesting um, color. And it's just you know, the, the sense of, of appreciation of being able to, to experience this kind of uh, beauty. Um, and appreciation practice can be recalling um, the kindness of others or our own kindness, appreciating when we've done something that's helped someone, someone else, recalling our own, our own goodness. Um, and again, just as a sort of sideline, there's a really interesting um, Buddhist practice that, that it's encouraged when people are dying or coming close to dying, that their friends should remind them of all the good things they've done in their lives to really remind them of their own goodness. And, uh, and I think that that's a really, a really beautiful practice um, to be with people. And, um, you know, maybe in the weeks before their passing and even, even at the time of their passing, just to remind people of, uh, of all the good that they've done 
and of the affection that other people have for them, the good, the goodness they brought about for, um, for other people. And so it, it seems to me that um, this practice of, of appreciation really supports our equanimity, really helps us when we are um, when we are experiencing um, outcomes that um, that maybe weren't the outcomes that we we had hoped for. Um, and along with gratitude, um, a practice of, of service, even in, in little ways. I mean, one of the things that, that, you know, the first thing the Buddha always teaches is generosity. And one reason the Buddha taught generosity is because it feels so good. You know, it's generosity is, um, is a practice that often, uh, when it is wholehearted, it just makes us feel so good to have done something that uh, helps another, that supports another. So, you know, and and sometimes it can be as as simple as watering a thirsty plant. You know, you're kind of in a rush, but you see your plant drooping, and you just take the time to water the drooping plant, a little act of, of generosity. But you know, our mindfulness always encourages us to look for kind of what the, uh, what the residue of an act is. And you know, I'm always surprised at how much better I feel when I've stopped and watered the plant instead of, of rushing on. So you know, noticing, noticing the benefits of our generosity, our kindness for ourselves and for others. And I think that that's, um, that's one of the ways that uh, we strengthen ourselves as individuals and as a, a community and that we um, help ourselves move forward in our, our spiritual lives and our you know, sort of um, socially responsible lives. So that's pretty much what I wanted to offer tonight. And what I'm hoping is that people will um, share it, maybe how they have worked with disappointment, how they've coped with, uh, with change, some of the things that are, or even just practices that, uh, you find supportive um, in, your, in your daily life, um, practices with people or, uh, or with animals. So please just unmute yourself and, um, and uh, share what you'd like to share. And noticing that it, it feels good. And it feels, I mean, we're not always appreciated when we do something for someone else, but it's always so nice when someone acknowledges something that we've, that we've done. Um, you know, uh, the sort of, uh, I, I often, when people stop when I'm walking my dog and they, and they stop where it, the signs say you're supposed to stop for pedestrians. And I wait to see if someone's gonna stop. And when they stop, I wave to them and they often wave back and you know, and they smile and, and it's, uh, it's just this, this small little, interaction of acknowledgement and um, you know I feel safer and um, I think they feel really really good about it and it's really important to pay attention to those small 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 things because they do add up um, I, I bought a card for a friend recently that said friendship isn't one big thing it's a million little things. And I think that that's really true. So what are some other things that people would like to share? And, you know, I mean, this is, is sort of one of those instances where, um, you know, you don't expect there's gonna be a good, a good outcome. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the really good outcome happens. 
you know, I mean, it, it's, it's gets us back to that um, idea of impermanence and, and we just don't know, but it's beautiful that you were able to care for her in that, in that way and uh, provide the time for her to, uh, to recover. Um, that's a, uh, a really, a really beautiful story. And, and it might have gone another way. So, I mean, that's what we, we often, um, I was with a, a friend in a, um, some, uh, some friends in a, actually in Bhutan, where one person in our group had a stroke. I mean, fortunately, we weren't up in the mountains, but I thought, okay, this is just going to have a really bad ending, no matter what. This is just, it's all downhill from, from here. And actually, I mean, this person was paralyzed on, on one side and um, we got to this little, little hospital, which was a kind of BYOB, bring your own bedding hospital in this, in this uh, small city that we were at. And the doctor was um, great. He'd been trained in Cuba. And he said, I know you are very upset and very concerned, but this is just a TMI stroke. This is something that will go away. It will, it will heal completely. And, um, and it turned out that, that it did. I mean, we, uh, it, there's sort of a, a lot of complications calling doctors in the States and stuff, but, um, but my friend has recovered completely and actually was recovered in about two days. And, um, you know, but it was one of those times where I thought, okay, um, you know, just, we're just going to deal with this because this, there's going to be no, no happy ending to this. I mean, I was just convinced there was no happy ending to, uh, to this story. And much to all of our surprise and delight, there really was. And, um, you know, those are those are um, good things to to remember um, that sometimes when we think it will only be the worst, um, it may not be so. And I think about that particularly in this time of um, you know when we're all just so aware of. Um, you know, all the, the dreadful things that are going on with the environment. And Joanna, I take to heart Joanna Macy's work about really, um, you know, we are all part of this um, great, great turning, the great turning of consciousness, um, the, uh, not, uh, the not giving up. And I think that that's really, um, important and so speaking of Joanna Macy I didn't expect to read this poem but I will read it because it is just one of my favorite most inspiring poems and I think bears on some of what we were talking about um, this evening and um, Joanna Macy uh, who is, she's now 92. She's still doing translations of, of Rilke. In the 60s, she was in Germany working for the CIA. She got involved with Chernobyl, um, doing healing work around Chernobyl. Um, she's just been this, this amazing Buddhist scholar, philosopher, um, eco-activist. And she has this wonderful book called active hope, how to face the mess we're in without going crazy. And um, this is her poem from her, her book. She says, when you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. 
This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings and by earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength and eloquence and staying powder, power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth, it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. I'll read that last two stanzas. We, uh, the last, well, I'll read it all again because I think most poems that are worth reading are worth reading at least twice. And I think there's a lot in here. When you act on behalf of something greater than yourself, you begin to feel it acting through you with a power that is greater than your own. This is grace. Today, as we take risks for the sake of something greater than our separate individual lives, we are feeling graced by other beings and by earth itself. Those with whom and on whose behalf we act give us strength and eloquence and staying power we didn't know we had. We just need to practice knowing that and remembering that we are sustained by each other in the web of life. Our true power comes as a gift like grace because in truth, it is sustained by others. If we practice drawing on the wisdom and beauty and strengths of our fellow human beings and our fellow species, we can go into any situation and trust that the courage and intelligence required will be supplied. So I find that idea about trusting, trusting in each other and uh, really believing that in any situation, the courage and intelligence that we need in any, any crisis, in any situation will be supplied. And I try to hold that as I think about our environmental crisis, that the courage and intelligence will be there for us to act together. How often, right view seems like sort of an orthodoxy, you know, like what is right view and do I have it? I mean, there's a, it's, it's very easy to sort of slip into that kind of orthodoxy around thinking about, you know, right view, right intention. Um, but the other thing you said that's so interesting about, um, you know, trying to find a problem. In uh, Mindful of Race, uh, one of the things that Ruth King talks about in um, her discussion about sort of the um, social cultural hindrances is that she said that, you know, part of white dominant culture is always to look for um, the problem. And, and so often I have had um, friends say, you know, like, um, just just tell me what's the problem and what do I do about it? And and Ruth um, argues that 
sort of just wanting to fix what's the problem, how do I fix it, is not, um, not an appropriate response because what's needed is really understanding the experience, uh, the lived experience, the spiritual experience, the, the history of what is going on that kind of gives rise to that, that thing that seems to be a problem. So that, that the, the sort of um, white mind is the kind of problem fixing mind, which is often a strength. I mean, in lots of circumstances, the problem fixing mind is, is useful, but often when great injustice has been done, the problem fixing mind is not, <clears throat> not the appropriate response because it doesn't have enough context and understanding and actually an understanding of suffering and understanding of the lived experience of others which is often really a painful kind of thing. So, um, so that's really uh, um, an interesting area and something I've thought a lot about since I've done um, the training with Ruth. So that's, that's her, her wonderful book, Mindful of Race. So we're at, at the end of our evening. So we'll, um, we'll share the merit, this wonderful act of imaginative generosity. <clears throat> if there's any goodness to our practice, any merit, any benefit, any blessing, we would joyfully, gladly, happily share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would share it with our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our community. We would share it with all those we like, and we'd also share it with those we don't like so much. We would share any blessings with those we know and with the millions upon millions of persons we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any goodness with the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the finny. May all beings everywhere find a path to peace. May all beings everywhere be free from suffering. So thank you all for being here and Shelley will be here next week. And um, I hope you'll have a good night. So take care. <clears throat>